Hi, good evening, everybody. Good evening to our wonderful uh, Carson residents and anybody else that along with you is now watching this town hall. Um, this is the first of what may be a number of town hall meetings. The mayor is here with me to speak and welcome you. And in addition, we have three representatives from different departments in the county who I'll introduce shortly, but representing Public Works, AQMD, and the um, Department of Environmental Health, uh, part of the Department of Public Health. Um, I wanna make sure that you know, this is only gonna be an hour. Um, there's a lot of listening and talking that will go on. But if your question is not one of the ones that was chosen to be spoken about tonight, we will be responding to everybody via email or whatever method you use to write to us. So I just wanted to assure you that we'll be getting back to everybody. I am ready now to introduce Mayor Lula Davis Holmes. And Mayor, uh, welcome and would you please make some remarks? You are mute. First of all, let me thank everyone for joining us this e evening uh, for this, the city of Carson's first town hall meeting. We've had several that have been put on by the county, but I know the residents have been wanting us to give, uh, put on a town hall meeting. This has been a long process and to my residents, we've heard you. Um, I want you to know that I did not check into a hotel. I've been right here in the middle of this. I have not been in an eye for tower my kids, my family, my husband, we've all been here fighting through this process and we are hoping and praying that uh, it will soon end. So a little background on this, the city council goal for this evening is to provide better understanding to the event that began on October 4th with an odor that smelled like rotten eggs. Later, it was determined to be hydrogen sulfide and re was reported to the South Coast Air Quality Management by not only our staff, but also our residents. Los Angeles County took responsibility for the mitigation of the odor and that was determined to be coming from the Domingos Channel, a county flood control channel. Since then, the city has taken various steps to protect and assist its residents and businesses. The city is thankful for our county supervisor and her staff that have responded quickly toward working on getting us a seat at the table so that our voices could be heard. The city will be instituting an independent analysis of the technical data. Our residents have requested that we do that. The city is looking forward to a more collaborative approach with the county to prevent this type of event from reoccurring in our great community and to bring the channel to a healthy condition. Our two entities have already worked together in a number of important ways to start both the city and the county declared a public nuisance on October 11th. Local, local emergency proclamations have been adopted by both the city and the county. The city of Carson adopted its uh, local emergency on October 25th and the county followed uh, a week later. The city and the counties are working together to secure a declaration of emergency from the governor. This will help with resources needed and the cutting of bureaucratic red tape to bring the channel to a healthy condition more quickly. What do we know today? The county provided the funding for our residents to relocate to neighborhood neighboring hotels. This funding by the county is very, very much appreciated. With their efforts, the smell is diminishing or non-existent in some areas in the city of Carson. The county continues to investigate, investigate the cause, including looking at bringing the channel to a healthy condition. The county is continuing to provide air filters. The Apollyon application and the aeration of the water is breaking up the hydrogen sulfide and not just masking it. If you do not smell hydrogen sulfide, it is not present in the air. 
The county Department of Health has reported that hydrogen sulfide does not accumulate in the body and does not have long-term health effects. Moving forward, the county's hotel accommodation program will begin to ramp down based upon the hydrogen sulfide levels. That means that a lot of the residents will be returning to their homes once the county health department declares that the levels are safe for the residents to come home. The county, not the city of Carson, will make that determination. We will continue to update the city council and our residents via website, through social media, and using the alert notification system that sends updates through text messages known as Ready Carson. There are several ways to sign up for Ready Carson, but the one easy way is to remember to register by visiting readycarson.com. The city will work with the county to bring the channel to a healthy condition. We, the city council, are united in this approach to dealing with the event, and we are speaking as a unified council. And I wanna thank our residents for being so patient and understanding that although this event is in the city of Carson, the county of LA has taken full responsibility because they're responsible for maintaining the channel and they will be responsible for bringing it to a level that is safe and we encourage all of our residents to continue to use the air purifiers and to contact uh, the county at 211 or the city of Carson if you need further assistance. With that, I'll turn it back over to our city manager, Sharon Hel Pepper. Sharon Landers, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> it's okay, don't worry. Um, okay, thank you so much. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to our next speaker who is going to be the LA direct county, the, excuse me, from LA County direct, direct Department of Public Works, Russ uh, Bardin, Bryden, and he's the incident commander. So with that, Russ, would you go ahead and um, provide your report? Uh, thank you. Mic check real quick. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Very good, thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council and the residents of the City of Carson. Thank you for having me tonight. My name is Russ Bryden and I am the County's Incident Commander for the Dominguez Channel Odor Incident. Uh, I wanna thank you for the invitation to attend tonight's Town Council, Town Hall, uh, and I look forward to answering your questions in a minute. Uh, I'll start by providing an update on the status of the incident. Um, before I do that, I also want to thank all the affected residents, each one of you, for your continued patience as we work to remediate this odor incident and the odor coming from the channel. I also want to thank our partner agencies, two of which are here tonight, and that's a, the Air Quality Management District, Southern California Air Quality Management District, and Los Angeles County Department of Public Health for all of their efforts. Uh, they've been working around the clock to help us bring this incident to an end. Okay, so with that, an update, and I have good news to report. So the downward trend in hydrogen sulfide readings continues. Excellent progress has been made on the odor issue. Um, for context, we began this incident with readings as high as 7,000 parts per billion, 7,000 parts per billion. Within the last 24 hours, we had a high of only nine parts per billion, and at only one of our locations, one of the monitoring locations. The vast majority of the sensor network, our fence, fence sensor network, has indicated low, low readings uh, in the single digits, part, single digits of parts per billion. So we've made vast improvement from 7,000 parts per billion down to a high yesterday of only nine parts per billion. Okay, so for further context, I'd like to provide a, a quick summary of the incident to date. So this began on October 7th. It began with Public Works being notified that a foul odor was coming from Dominguez Channel. Upon investigation, our engineers discovered 90 acre feet of water within an estuary of Dominguez Channel had zero dissolved oxygen. That condition resulted in rapid growth of bacteria that utilized anaerobic digestion to process the organic materials within the channel. So a byproduct of that process, of that anaerobic digestion, is hydrogen sulfide. 
So let me be clear, that's hydrogen sulfide, which is a colorless gas known for its foul kind of rotten egg or sulfury smell. Um, and you can smell it even at very, very low concentrations. So when we tested the water within the channel, what we call the water column, we found that it had been impacted to the point where, as I mentioned, the dissolved oxygen concentration was basically zero. And that's mainly due to the high chemical oxygen demand, all that anaerobic bacteria or anaerobic process within the channel. We also found high levels of acetone and sulfides within the channel. Um, acetones were at approximately 9.6 milligrams per liter, and the sulfides were at 80 milligrams per liter. These are also byproducts of anaerobic digestion. So in response, we mobilized our in-house experts, along with other public agency experts and the private sector to investigate and develop solutions. It truly has been a national level response. We began by spraying the channel with a biodegradable odor neutralizer. We're currently spraying approximately 13,000 gallons of this a day at six locations off of bridges, using boats, and even using drones to access the hard to reach areas of the channel. So th this neutralizer, it's actually a compound that bonds to the hydrogen sulfide within the water and converts it to a non-odorous, non-toxic biodegradable salt. So it interacts with that hydrogen sulfide inside the water column, converts it to a solid structure before it ever exits the water column and gets into the air, turns it into that solid structure and it settles out through the water um, basically to the bottom of the channel. So nothing or very low amounts are escaping into the atmosphere at this point. Um, <clears throat> we also began aerating the channel using nano bubblers. So nano bubblers, if you have a fish tank, you can think of it like the, your airline in a fish tank. It injects millions of tiny oxygen bubbles into the estuary um, and it's introducing that oxygen in, in there. So it will flip it from that anaerobic or non-oxygen state to a more healthy aerobic state and in turn, it kills the bad bacteria, which are causing the odor um, that's resulted in this incident. Okay, we're also working with our partner agencies on a plan to add ozone to the nano bubblers as well. Ozone is a powerful um, oxidant commonly used in wastewater treatment plants, um, and these are the solutions that we've been that working on to implement to bring the uh, bring the incident to a close. Um, there is consensus among our partner agencies across not only the state but nationally, that these are the most effective tools available to deal with the hydrogen sulfide. And the result can be seen in our air quality monitoring data that you'll see momentarily from the South Coast Air Quality Management District. So we're seeing very, very positive results from this. Since October 29th, so since last month, air monitoring for the hydrogen sulfide has consistently measured at near pre-incident levels in the neighborhoods across and adjacent to the channel and throughout the city of Carson. These levels are far below the state's nu public nuisance level of 30 parts per billion. So remember, we're in single digits and often non-detect, often zero, um, with the exception of one location, the monitoring station east at, uh, at 213th Street and Chico uh, in, the, uh, in the city of Carson. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Lowell will speak to these numbers in more detail, so I won't go, go too much further into them. Uh, but based on these consistent readings, Public Works believes that we have reduced the production of hydrogen sulfide to the atmosphere to the point where residents can begin to safely return to their homes and we can begin working on a, a, a permanent solution to return the estuary to a healthy state and remediate the underlying source of the odor. Um, our Public Health Department, County Public Health, has provided residents with a number of recommendations for returning to, uh, returning to their homes. So now for this incident, recovery includes restoring the ecology of the community to pre-disaster conditions. This includes restoring the health of the estuary. Um, this is going to be a, a large project and the process will involve robust community import and it'll take upwards of two years to complete. So this completes my report. I wanna thank everyone affected by this incident for your continued patience. And I look forward to answering your questions in a minute. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. We very much appreciate that. And we're going to move on then to our next speaker. We'll come back to you, Russ, with questions in a little bit. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Jason Lowe. And Dr. Lowe is with the South Coast 
Air Quality Management District, also known as AQMD. And he will give us some additional information to supplement what we just heard from the Department of Public Works. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Lowe. Great, thank you so much, Sharon. Good evening and thank you, City of Carson, for hosting us. And I want to sympathize with the experience that you may continue to have. Um, South Coast AQMD continues to use all available resources to respond to this odor event. And you can still continue to report odors to the South Coast AQMD at 1-800-CUT-SMOG or 1-800-288-7664 or by using an online complaint system found on our website, www.aqmd.gov. In total, we have received and responded to more than 4,300 odor complaints since October 3rd. We continue our air monitoring efforts, as uh, Russ had mentioned, in the community near the Dominguez Channel in coordination with Public Works, LA County Fire Health and Hazmat, LA County Department of Public Health, and other agencies. And we def definitely appreciate their support uh, and, and efforts towards us. We have an existing network of air monitoring stations measuring hydrogen sulfide, and other pollutants such as gaseous air toxics that measure and report these levels in re near real time on our website. Also, in response to the odor incident, we deployed a new temporary air monitor near the Dominguez Channel on 213th and Chico, which Rutz had mentioned. Overall, we continue to see that downward trend in hydrogen sulfide, uh, and we see that on all of our monitors. And as of today, we have seen hydrogen sulfide at our community monitoring stations to be below 30 parts per billion since October 29th. Concentrations at these sites are headed towards numbers that are more typical of what we'd expect in typical background air and generally observed in these areas on a normal day. At our temporary monitor at 213th and Chico, uh, which is next to the channel, has been showing a huge improvement uh, in the hydrogen sulfide levels. And this is where we had recorded the incident high hourly reading of 7,000 parts per billion, which is 200 times more than the California nuisance standard of 30 parts per billion. As Russ had mentioned, we are seeing much lower numbers, over 90% lower than what we uh, saw from that high. And most of the values are well below the 30 parts per billion uh, nuisance standard. For the last week, the highest reading that we saw um, was 88 parts per billion. And Russ has mentioned that in the last two days, the maximum levels that we've observed um, have been below 10 parts per billion. We also deployed our mobile monitor last week, which measures hydrogen sulfide on a vehicle going through the streets of the community. Um, and we went through Carson and all the way to Long Beach, and we compared that to levels that we uh, saw earlier in the incident in October. Uh, and what we found is that the levels that uh, were observed during this mobile monitoring um, were much lower uh, than what we saw in October uh, throughout the community. And the highest level that we saw instantaneously was 55 parts per billion. As always, data can change or be impacted by many factors. Um, so we continue to keep an eye on the data, the weather, the wind direction, and any other factors that could impact the hydrogen sulfide levels and odors affecting you. We do want to acknowledge that while hydrogen sulfide uh, levels are showing a really good decline, it does not mean that the odors have stopped completely. For even in, in the below 10, 10 parts per billion, um, people can still smell hydrogen sulfide. Our investigation remains ongoing, and uh, at that will conclude my report. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Okay, well, don't go anywhere though, Dr. Lowe. We will come back to you with questions. Thank you. So now I'm gonna to turn to the last of our three speakers. And uh, Lisa Frias is from the Department of Public Health from the county and is also the Director of Environmental Health. And Lisa, I know you have some remarks to make as well. Yes, thank you so much. I reiterate, um, you know, appreciation for everybody who's participating in this call um, this evening. We definitely, you know, remain committed to working with the city of Carson, the residents of Carson, and our partners here. Um, I think it's really important to share, you know, that, you know, public health has been engaged in this process from the beginning, and we will continue to be engaged. Um, as mentioned by numerous speakers already, the air quality in relationship to the hydrogen sulfide levels has improved significantly. Um, you've heard that the state standard right now is 30 parts per billion for a one hour average exposure. And so the levels are low enough. Um, so that's why we have developed documents to help residents return to home. Um, it's really important, as you know, Jason said, 
If you continue to smell the odors, please continue to report, report those to the South Coast Air Quality Management District so that we can continue to stay closely monitoring the levels. Um, we want to also make sure that residents who temporarily relocated should start preparing to return to home and look at the return to home, the return to home tip sheet. Hopefully everybody's visited the lacounty.gov slash emergency website. There's a lot of tools and documents that are available for you to be able to review and read and prepare to return to home. Some of the steps that you can take now are, of course, making sure that you go and check to see whether or not you have odors inside your home before you actually return to home. You know, take a look and see whether or not you perhaps have spoiled trash or if you have food. Um, also, you know, oftentimes if you've left your home and you come back, you're going to have some odors. Um, so it's important that you go through and you, you know, throw away things that, that have an odor so that you don't confuse those odors with potentially the odors that may be outside. Secondly, air out your home and make sure that if you have any foul odors that you take out the trash, um, look at opening your windows and let it flush out for a couple of hours before you actually close your windows and close your doors. The third thing we wanna make sure that you do before you go back is of course, increasing the airflow within your home. For those who have central um, heating or ventilation or air conditioning systems, if you haven't done so already, please replace those with the HVAC filters, one that has an appropriate size for your system and is designated as a HEPA or a MERV rated um, filter with activated carbon or activated charcoal. Um, residents should also run the system with the windows and doors closed for at least 30 minutes before returning home. And if you do not wish to cool or heat the home, um, place the HVAC system on the fan only side. It's also recommended that you do go back and once again, the Department of Public Works is offering, you know, filters for your home. So it's really important to take advantage of that um, before you go to, you know, your return home. Um, for those who do not have um, an HVAC system and if you'd like to use a portable um, air filtration system, it's important that you also obtain those before you return to home and you start utilizing those in rooms at least two hours before you go back home please make sure that you turn them on. Um, as a reminder, you can still get reimbursed. So please make sure that you keep that in mind. Don't hesitate. You know, you really wanna take a look at the size of the filtration systems to make sure that they're able to, of course, protect the rooms where you're gonna be sleeping in. And, and as we mentioned, the levers are low enough now where you're not gonna have any potential long-term impacts or even short-term impacts but it's important you're still gonna smell them and it can affect people differently. So we wanna make sure that you mitigate that odor inside your home by using either your HVAC system or your air filtration system. And if you do have odor still, and if you're experiencing any symptoms that you feel are life-threatening, you wanna make sure that you do seek medical attention. Um, if you are concerned, we do have a public health hotline that you can contact. We've been um, you know, receiving calls and providing advice to residents um, through this entire process, and we will continue to do that. Um, it is important, as we said earlier, that hydrogen sulfide levels, although low, can still be you know, smelled by residents. So it's really important to just not think about, well, I'm smelling it, there's a risk to me, I don't wanna return home. Um, look at all of the mitigation strategies that have been placed in front of you, keeping your doors closed, your windows closed, and then of course, when odors aren't present, open them up. Um, as far as the, the beginning of the incident, you've already heard, so I'm not going to repeat that so that we can make sure we do have time to answer your questions. Um, hydrogen sulfide levels, at this point in time, we've had a lot of concerns as what are the long-term implications. At this time, there is no anticipated long-term implications. Um, so we will continue to, of course, work with our state partners, our federal partners, um, to look at the levels, uh, make sure that we continue to keep the community updated, we will continue to post information on that website. So continue to go back and look at that regularly. And as I said, I'm gonna provide you with the numbers to contact us specifically to address mitigation strategies. If you're concerned by going home and you're thinking, well, I've done everything I can, what else can I do? You can contact us at 626-430-9821. Leave a message and somebody from public health will call you back and we'll answer all of your questions and walk you through 
what are some of the steps that you've taken and what additional steps you can take so that you can return home safely? Um, I think at this point in time, I will go ahead and turn it back over to you, Sharon, so that we can open it up to questions and answers. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. I am gonna ask you to repeat that phone number because sure. the, if the sound is a little choppy and I wanna make sure everybody hears that. Yes, the number is 626-430-9821. Okay, yeah. great. And I just wanna add to um, Sharon that we will continue to be, of course, at the Victoria Park location and the other locations as long as you know Public Works is there. We will also be supporting any of the activities that are needed to make sure that residents do feel safe. Okay, well, thank you for those remarks. So let's turn um, to the Q&A. The information you all provided was very informative, but it always still leaves questions. And um, we've gone through, we've gotten a lot of questions from our residents. And I wanna just reiterate to our residents that if we didn't pull your questions for tonight, we still will get back to everybody. We wanna make sure that everybody's questions are answered, but we did try to take representative questions. And, um, and so let's see how we do here. So um, I'm not quite sure who wants to start with this first one, but it, it's getting into the issue of, we're talking about people going home now, and Lisa addressed that, and some of the things that people can do to really make sure their house is ready. But there's a concern about why would we start talking about going home when there's still information that's being waited on. So I think we have a lot of really good information now about what is actually happening with the hydrogen sulfide levels. And that was addressed by both um, Dr. Lowe and Russ. But what about the water level, the, the information about what is going on in the water? Those numbers have not really been, um, they haven't come back to normal yet. And why would it be okay for our residents to go home when we still are at a point where our water is not what we would consider to be healthy? I, I'm breaking up this one question. It actually is rather long. So maybe one of the three of you can address that particular question. So this is Russ, if you'll allow me, I'll start with the answer and then maybe my colleagues would like to jump in afterward. So the direct answer to the question is that water, the water sampling we've done um, doesn't affect or delay treatment of the odor issue. We know the odor is caused by hydrogen sulfide. It's that's a gas by, byproduct of decomposition in the channel. So we know that. Uh, we, we've observed an increased amount of acetone in the channel water. And I shared that in my, my opening remarks. And we've also seen a higher concentration of the sulfides at one point. Both of these are consistent with anaerobic conditions. Um, and these constituents are found in the, the, the these constituents that, uh, that we find within the water, they stay in the water, they don't exit the water, and they have no impact on public health. Okay, so I think that helps a lot. Um, did anybody else want to add to that? Or is that pretty complete on that part of the question? Okay, so I, I don't know, maybe Russ, you're going to want to stay in the hot seat for the moment. This is um, really approaching the same issue, but in a slightly different way. So it, it has been said, and I think actually, Russ, you said it as well, that remediation could take two years. Mm -hmm. So maybe what you could do is explain, what do you mean by, you, I don't know that you use the word remediation, but you do talk about returning the channel to a healthy condition. What, why might that take so long? And why, again, is it okay to go back home while that kind of work is going on? Make sure I'm unmuted. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so returning to Dominguez, returning the Dominguez Channel to a healthy estuary, a, a state of health, is the long-term goal for the waterway improvement. Um, you know, just to just to say it, there are different ways that we are looking at to cause that healthy condition um, to to come into being. Um, this is part of our our nationwide. Uh, reconnaissance, our nationwide conversation with scientists and other experts um, on the best means of doing that. Uh, we have several solutions that we think um, are probably the best way to do that, but it's going to take time to implement those. These are large-scale projects. Um, we're guessing on the order of two to three years. 
It's going to require collaboration and planning at the local level with the city, with the state, with federal agencies, and of course, with the community members. But in answer to the question, why is it safe to come back home before there's a permanent solution? The permanent solution is disconnected. This anaerobic state is separate from the permanent return of the estuary to a healthy condition. We know that it's the anaerobic bacteria that's causing the hydrogen sulfide. The solutions of the um, deaeration with the addition of aerating with ozone will flip it from those anaerobic conditions back to aerobic conditions. And we know in the interim that the odor caused by the hydrogen sulfide that it stays within the water, or that the um, that the odor neutralizer has been effective, um, and that hydrogen sulfide turns to a solid, stays within the water column. There is nothing in the water column that's escaping to the uh, the atmosphere that the public should be concerned with. So that permanent solution really is once we flip it to get all that other stuff that's in the channel, anything that might cause this in the future, to remove that and make sure something like this doesn't happen again. So would you maybe? be able to explain whether the work that you're going to be doing to create that healthy estuary might in itself result in unsafe conditions for our residents. Because that's another thing that everybody would be worried about coming home and now having a process going on that could take two to three years and create other health issues. Yeah, so it's really premature to comment on that at this point. It's going to depend on what we determine is necessary to, to, uh, to permanently resolve the, the organic material in the channel, to permanently resolve the, the source that's feeding this anaerobic condition. There are multiple ways to do that. Each one of them has a, a different timeline. Each one of them has a, a different effect. Um, and it's, it'd really just be premature to, to discuss any, any level of even moderate risk at this point. So. I think we'll need to wait till we study this a little bit more to answer that question. Okay, but Russ, let me help you out a little bit um, because I think I know a couple of things that I think would be helpful for our audience to hear. One is that part of the reason that it's taking so long to think about how to move forward is because you are giving great consideration to all the different aspects of how to move forward. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is that there is a lot of effort that's now been put in place to create monitoring around the channel. And um, is it maybe our AQMD um, representative would be able to confirm that, uh, Dr. Lowe, that this monitoring will take place and potentially even be heightened if needed during any work that's ongoing so that there'll be early warning should there be any additional problems going forward. So I can chime in. I mean, we are working closely with the Department of Public Works to, to uh, look at the mitigation measures and potential uh, releases that may come from that. Um, they're working with us and, and um, you know, and, and, um, what they're doing so we can um, potentially predict and, and uh, scale uh, up or down um, uh, monitoring as appropriate. Because if there are uh, potential concerns, then um, there will be um, measures in place for us to evaluate that. Um, so that is that is something that uh, we work will work with them, and of course our, our partners at Public Health also to advise on, on potential other uh, chemicals that uh, could be monitored. Okay, thank you. Um, Turning to, add... to a completely different subject for a moment now, reimbursement. So uh, there there have been a lot of questions, and I have a few questions here about the reimbursement program. To start with, how long will it take? for reimbursement process once you've submitted? And then who can um, a resident contact in the county if they're feeling that uh, too much time has gone by and they haven't heard back on their reimbursement request? I think I can take this one as well. Um, so in terms of how long will it take for reimbursement to occur. I want to first start out by saying that this is absolutely one of the top priorities uh, for Public Works and for the county. Um, the holidays are coming up. Public Works has reassigned staff from across our department, our 4,000 person department, to ensure that we can quickly process reimbursement requests. It takes about three weeks for the county to issue a check. So you submit an application through LA County's emergency website. And so for our, our constituents, that website is lacounty.gov slash emergency 
slash Dominguez hyphen channel. That's the website where you can submit your application. Um, and then you'll be asked to submit receipts and any other required documents. So the timeline for that is approximately three weeks. And we have reassigned staff to, um, to make sure that that's happening absolutely as quickly as possible. Okay, and would you give that website again? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the website is lacounty.gov slash emergency slash Dominguez hyphen channel. Okay, thanks Russ. Um, while we're on the topic of reimbursements, I, I would like to turn to the air purifiers and this may be something Lisa could help with. Um, if air purifiers are being distributed at Victoria Park, how can I receive one that will be adequate for the size of my home, which is over 1500 square feet? And we've gotten this question a lot, Lisa, that the air purifiers being distributed at Victoria Park are small and uh, maybe only two are being given out to a person and that may not cover their house. So could you please um, help answer that question? Sure, I can try and answer it. Every air purifier has a different rating, right, for the size of the room that it can actually, you know, cover. So it will be important to really think about the placement of that air filtration system, that portable device, as far as where you place it. So if you're going to be perhaps, um, you know, going to bed, you might want to take it to your bedroom. I, I do know, and, and Russ, I'm going to lean on you a little bit on this one, that if the, you know, if residents do need to get you know, more filtration systems for their homes. I think Public Works has been accommodating that, but it does depend on the type of filtration system that is being used. So it's really important. We do have a tip sheet on how to select, you know, the right purifier based on square footage. Um, as I mentioned, every one of them is different. So, you know, take into account the size of the room, where you're gonna be spending time, making sure that you do have it in those rooms. Okay, thank you, Russ. Did you want to add anything to that, or was that good? Yep, I think that uh, I think that answered the question. Okay, great. Okay, so you know the county and the city both proclaimed local emergencies, and we were told that this was a requirement before the governor would consider declaring a state of emergency. I'm curious. Uh, I'm saying this on behalf of a resident now who would like to know, what would that mean for this particular event? What is the uh, benefit of having a declared state of emergency by the governor? Russ, is that something that you might be able to address? Um, I, I think probably this question would be best answered by our partners at the emergency management team, um, or even the state's Cal OES group. Um, the Office of Emergency Services. Um, I, I don't think the three of us are probably in the best position to answer that tonight, um, but I think what we can do is we can take that question back, uh, go straight to those agencies, um, and then I think it would be good to, to get it directly back to you, uh, City Manager Landers, to share with you, your, your residents. Okay, well, I would appreciate you doing that, but I will give you what we believe the answer to be, um, because we feel very strongly that it would be very important for us to get a declared state of emergency. And it may be confusing to some because, again, we're already at a point where the Department of Health is considering the nuisance itself to be de minimis and will at some point in the future soon be sending people home. Why would we be thinking about declaring or asking the governor still to declare a state of emergency? So what I would understand is twofold. One is that by getting the governor to do that, it will provide additional resources to the county, primarily the county, but also the city. And one of the things that I've heard in my conversations with the county was they didn't feel that they could ask for there to be a declaration until they were at a point where the expenditure of resources hit a certain level, where they were able to say that it's beyond the county to continue doing this. And we do know that there are two things that are gonna happen. One is that you're still putting out the pullion and you're still doing the nanobubblers and there are other things that you're doing in the immediate time frame. And then long-term, the, the return of the, um, the channel to a healthy estuary 
is likely to be not only a long process, but a very expensive process. And rather than this being just a burden on our residents for the county and the city, it, this is one of those situations where just like a, an oil spill, we think that this is an area where state funds need to be kicked in. Um, this is a very unusual situation. And so it's not that, it's not a question as to when somebody's going home, it's a question that there's still a lot of work to be done. And the state help in this regard, both in terms of resources, but also because there are three different entities that oversee this protected flood control um, channel. The county may own it, but it's under the jurisdiction of the State Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. It's under the jurisdiction of the US Corps of Engineers. And it's under the jurisdiction of the, um, I believe it's State Regional Water Control Board. And all of them have a lot of requirements. And by and large, those requirements prevent things from being done to water bodies that are protected. And we clearly want something to happen here where this water body is returned to a healthy state. And frankly, from the city's point of view, we would like to think about making this into um, a gem in the middle of our city also. It's a little bit too early to be talking about that because that would really involve visioning by our community as to what that might entail. But there are a lot of things that we think should be done going forward. I know that your public works director who I've spoken to is of like mind on this. Um, but I think that, I hope that helps out a little bit in explaining why the city and um, other officials of the county believe that, uh, that this should be something that the governor declares as an emergency. And specifically, it was Supervisor um, Holly Mitchell that brought that to the uh, County Board of Supervisors and received unanimous approval. And so now both the county and the city are working to see if we can get the governor to issue that declaration. So um, I didn't mean to speak that long, but I thought that was important. So I'm gonna um, move to the next question, which is from somebody that has ch young children and is saying that these children have, been, have severe allergies and so they've been affected by the H2S levels. Um, if the smell is down to low levels, when can we, re we return home? And is it really safe to do so? Um, I, I think that you've already addressed this, Lisa, but if you don't mind just reiterating um, so that this parent who is concerned about young children is reassured um, by you as to how to handle that. Sure. So the levels of hydrogen sulfide, as we've discussed, have not been high enough to cause eminent danger, but high enough to cause symptoms. Um, and that's why it was declared a nuisance. Fortunately, the levels now are well below the state standard of the 30 parts per billion and appear to be at pre-incident levels. So I think that's why you're hearing from public health that it's, you know, we, we need to start preparing perhaps to return home, taking a look at things, making sure that people are comfortable. Um, but it's important to remember because hydrogen sulfide is an irritant, even at these low levels, and we've mentioned, you still it still may impact some individuals, resulting in irritation to eyes, nose, and throat. Um, so to reduce these exposures, it's going to still be important that we follow the recommendations that we've listed in the community update that can that can be found on the website. So it's still important that you know you still may have some odors um, because they can be you know, um, they can be impacted at very low levels, but it doesn't cause an eminent danger and you can work through the symptoms. Hopefully, you know, for children who have allergies, if it's really impacted them, they should see their doctors. Um, but some of the recommendations that we have in the community update should help alleviate that. Thank you. Um, would you or Russ maybe jump in for a minute and also address something that we've heard that uh, if there's no smell, people are concerned that it's just being masked and it's still there. Yeah, I mean, that's not something that at this point in time, um, if, if you're not, there's always going to be odors, I would say. I mean, and Jason, I'll lean on you a little bit. And that's why we have, you know, air monitoring going on to really look at different, you know, exposures that may be in the community. And when we see pre-incident levels, it's because there are levels that perhaps are there, but you're not having an impact to it. Um, so, 
I think it's important that we all live in an environment where we are going to have different type of exposure levels, but it's the most important thing is, is it causing a public health issue, right? Are the levels high enough to cause, you know, a, a, either a long-term impact or a short-term impact? And so that's why at this point in time, the, you know, based on the levels that we're seeing now, they're not at nuisance levels with respect to the state definition, um, but they still could be enough to cause people's symptoms. But Jason, I don't know if you wanna add any more with respect to some of the air monitoring that's going on in the community because you have other receptors. Uh, absolutely, I think the, the main question that was presented was if, if the odors are being masked. Um, so to that specific question, so our, our uh, hydrogen sulfide monitors are very specific to hydrogen sulfide and we'll be able to detect them if there are other uh, pollutants in the air. So uh, if there was some sort of other odorant or some sort of um, other kind of, um, you know, kind of deodorizer, to, I guess, so to speak, um, the hydrogen sulfide um, would still remain in the air, would still be detected by our monitors, which are very specifically looking for that. Um, and other pollutants um, at some of our community sites um, would, would actually show up in some of the other monitors that we have there um, for like the gaseous air toxics or some other compounds that we're measuring um, in the community. So, um, th so if there is some sort of other odor in our gas, uh, it still won't cover the levels of hydrogen sulfide that are in the air that we detect. Okay, thank you. Um, could you explain, uh, I'm not quite sure, this might be um, still you, Doctor, what is known about why 213th Street in Chico would be what's been called the major emission source in the epicenter? Or that may be a Russ question, I'm not sure. Um, maybe I can start and then maybe Russ can fill in. Um, so um, essentially what we're looking at is where the highest levels of hydrogen sulfide were found. Um, so there was a lot of uh, air measurements at the very beginning when the levels were really high. Uh, we did some of our uh, mobile measurements um, and using also portable um, handheld hydrogen sulfide monitors to, to look in through different places within the community to determine what the levels were at different locations. And what we found was a very high level um, surrounding a, a very specific uh, place around Avalon Boulevard, um, which is where we had kind of that street access to the area uh, along the Dominguez Channel. And then we also leaned on our uh, friends from the fire department who actually went in the channel with some of the handheld um, portable hydrogen sulfide analyzers and, and measured uh, along the channel to kind of see um, what the, what the uh, hydrogen sulfide levels varied um, within the channel. And what was found is that the highest levels were found around that area. Um, and then basically they decrease away from that area. So that's why we would consider that the highest kind of emission area that was found through all those measurements. Thank you, Russ. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that's an excellent answer. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, will there be an emergency system in cases like this in the future? This is actually a two-part question. There's an additional question about returning home, but let's start with that. Will there be an emergency system in cases like this in the future? Emergency notification system. You know, I'm gonna try and take a stab at it and then, you know, I'll lean on my colleagues. You know, I think it's really important to, to look at this. This is an unprecedented event. And, and Russ, I mean, you know, you can chime in from a public works perspective. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's one of those systems when you typically have emergency systems, systems, it's because you, you know, you anticipate an emergency, for example, at refineries, right? They have emergency plans in place because potentially, you know, the operation, you know, may require you to implement an emergency system. In this situation, it, it's to some extent unprecedented. Russ, I mean, I'm going to lean on you. I don't think we've heard um, of this experience anywhere else to this level. That's correct. From our research and talking with our uh, scientific partners across the nation, we could not find another similar incident. Maybe what I can add is um, with the community monitoring um, that's um, nearby, um, and that would be our, um, there's the, the fence line monitoring network that's um, nearby the uh, on the refineries, as well as um, the air monitoring that we've um, been mentioning in the communities. Um, that are, are near Carson and in Carson, 
Um, they, we do have a subscription, an uh, email subscription that can provide notifications if air pollutants are uh, exceeding certain levels, uh, hydrogen sulfide being one of those pollutants. So um, on our website, if um, you go to www.acumd.gov, um, you'd be able to uh, subscribe to uh, certain air monitors that would be maybe close to you. Um, and if you would like to be notified if, if any of those pollutants would exceed levels that would be uh, considered uh, highly elevated. Okay, thank you. Um, shifting a little bit again, this time back to hotels, where would somebody direct calls at the county related to issues concerning hotels and hotel needs? I'd be happy to take that one. Uh, it's a, a, a very direct answer. You can call 211 from your phone, 211. That's the county's information line. Give, you their inf or give them your information uh, and then that information will be shared with our team at Public Works that does hotel placements um, and addresses these issues. So 211. Russ, is there a live person that's going to be on the other end or is it leaving a message and getting a call back, do you know? I believe there's a live person. The hours are, I want to say the hours are seven to seven, uh, at least seven to seven. Okay. Then, um, Lisa, I think this is for you. Would you confirm the air purifier reimbursement program details? Yeah, I'm gonna to have to defer to Russ. So Public Works is managing all of the reimbursement with respect to the you know, air purifying systems and the filtration. So Russ, do you wanna tackle that one? Sure, so I think the best way to answer this question um, is to, to refer to some of the things that we have talked about before. Um, and that's how you can submit a claim. Um, and so we've gone over that, uh, that website before. That was the lacounty.gov slash emergency slash Dominguez hyphen channel um, uh, website. Um, you can also go to one of the county's distribution centers. Uh, let me see if I can grab this. I do not have the addresses for these, but the information will be on the website. Um, air purifiers are being provided at Victoria Park within the city and then outside the city at the Wilmington Senior Center. The hours for Victoria Park are 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And for the Wilmington Senior Center, that's 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, thank you. We have a few, we have a, uh, time for just a few more questions. And so um, one of the questions that I have here is for our uh, disabled residents, is there assistance that will be offered to help them return back to their homes if they don't have a means of transportation? Mm. So who, I, who think I, that? I think that I can do that one. Okay. Um, the answer is yes, um, that we look forward to working with the city. Uh, I believe the city has a, a mobility assistance program, um, but folks that need additional help to move from where they've been displaced to relocated back to their homes, uh, we're looking into means to make that program available. And if I can just add, you know, as um, we have, you know, of course, those who do need assistance um, with the return to home and, you know, we will be able to, you know, walk them through. We've been doing that as part of, um, you know, public's health, health outreach is helping some of our senior residents um, operate air filtration devices, helping them set it up and making sure that that it's safe to return. So if there is support that's needed, once again, you can contact our public health hotline um, and leave a message and then we can coordinate that. And we are working with Public Works also. So if Public Works identifies that there is a need, then we coordinate that visit and we'll go to that resident's home. Thank you. Could one of you address a little bit more about what's been found in the water? I think that was touched on before but I think that there are other things people are wondering, what else are you finding in the water and how could it have gotten there in the first place? And if we don't know yet what is there, how, how are we gonna figure that out in the future? Mm -hmm. So this is Russ, I think I can take that question. Um, as I shared before, uh, we have done water quality sampling. Um, we have found uh, constituents that indicate high levels of anaerobic process. 
Um, we know that the dissolved oxygen concentration is basically at zero milligrams per liter, and that's due to high chemical oxygen demand. Uh, we've also found high levels of acetone. Um, these are products of anaerobic digestion. Um, levels are approximately 9.6 milligrams per liter. We've also found sulfides at approximately 80 milligrams per liter. And do you expect that you'll be finding other information out about the water? Mm. We understand what's happening with this process. And we understand what's contributing to the anaerobic digestion system. We do routine water quality monitoring as part of our, um, our, our stormwater permit, our permit to operate the, um, the flood control channel. All that information is available publicly. Uh, I'm unfamiliar with exactly what's measured, um, but all of that is reported publicly. If there are other constituents that are unrelated to this event, they'd be listed as part of that reporting. Okay, and this is the last set of questions. It starts with asking, what's gonna be done about the toxic gas that's obviously still lingering in the air? And I think that's been addressed, but maybe a quick summary on that. But there's still a concern that even though there are no odors, people are still getting sick and they want to know why they would be getting sick if there are no odors. You know, I'll try to answer that question, but I think that's one of those where, you know, we, we won't have an answer for that. Typically, if you're going to be smelling the odors, um, then that's when you're going to have the potential symptoms related. So if you're experiencing symptoms outside of odors, I mean, that's not something that we're going to necessarily be able to address here. I think, you you know, of course, is always seek medical attention um, to get some guidance from your medical doctors. But we do not anticipate if you're not smelling the odor, then you shouldn't be experiencing any symptoms. Okay. And then actually, I'm going to see that we have time for me to sneak in one more. So um, there was a question related to um, quality control at the hotels that residents have been relocated to. If somebody has a complaint about a hotel, how would they contact the county to register that complaint? Sure, so I'll take that one. So you can contact, of course, the Department of Public Health's Environmental Health Division. The number that you can call is 1-888-700-9995. Again, 1-888-700-9995. Seven hundred nine 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 five. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So we're on. Um, we are actually at uh, the point where we're going to look at wrapping up. And Mayor, I wanted to check to see if you had some closing remarks that you wanted to make. Well, first of all, I would like to definitely thank our LA County Supervisor Holly Mitchell um, for being uh, available for conversations throughout this uh, problem that we've been facing. And to, to the LA County Public Works, to you, Russ, for taking the time to come out and uh, be with us this evening. I know we've asked you to come out, uh, someone from Public Works to be with us at each of our council meetings. You have been uh, very supportive in coming out. And to Jason Lowe also uh, for, from AQMB, thank you so much for coming out and spending your time with us and to Dr. Lisa, well, for our Department of Health, thank you so much. And to our staff for working around the clock. We didn't know how this was going to go uh, because we, you know, we heard that we should be doing a town hall meeting and it takes a team to get, put these town hall meetings together. And we have been working as a team and trying to get answers to our residents. I just want to thank you, Sharon Landers and all of our staff Gerard, you have just been uh, priceless, but we are still uh, in a transition. And one question I wanted to ask, and I know you've hit on it a couple of times is how much notice, I know we're talking about transitioning back into the homes, but at how, how much notice are we gonna be giving our residents before they, uh, the program has ended, the, the, the uh, odor has been diminished, it's safe for you to return homes. It's not something that's gonna happen like I call you tonight and you're out tomorrow kind of situation. Russ, could you answer that for me? Sure, yes. Uh, make sure I'm off of mute. Uh, I, I would expect uh, ample time for residents to be able to adjust their plans uh, as public health or adjust their uh, accommodations. 
um, as a public health shared, now is the time to begin returning to your home, to open up windows, uh, to remove your trash, preparing to return home. Uh, I know that we have a, a number of information sessions planned throughout the community uh, and also several at hotels where uh, many of the, the displaced folks are staying um, in order to share information about uh, upcoming changes. Um, at the moment, I believe that the program runs through next Friday, um, which is the 26th. Um, so I would expect information on whether the program will be extended um, or whether it will be sunsetted at that point um, within the next week or so. After Thanksgiving. The 26th is after Thanksgiving. I would expect information over this weekend and the first part of next week okay. about next steps. Yeah, that's been one of my main uh, questions that I've been asked, you know, is there going to be a transition period? So I just want to thank you again uh, for coming out. I know this has been uh, very, it's been something we haven't experienced before. And I, I said earlier, my 10 months on as mayor of the city, I've had an earthquake, I've had a fire, and now I've had this odor. But uh, together we'll come through this. And our concern is, and my concern is, is the long-term effects and how, what are we going to do to remediate this so that it does not happen again? That's key to me. And once we identify all the causes, I still was still speculating about exactly what caused this problem. But I think at some point in time, when we get closer, we'll have the who, what, when, where, and why of this and make sure it doesn't happen again. So thank you very much, everyone. And to Sharon, thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mayor. And actually, on your great note, um, I'm going to end the meeting. I just want to echo your thanks to the county representatives and then to our staff here at the city for their incredibly hard work, particularly the folks at the call center, also mayor. So with that, thank you again. And residents, please let us know um, how, if you want to hear from us again in this format, we'll do it again. Um, and please turn in to our council meetings where we'll make sure that we always have an update. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. Thank you, everyone.